Well, good morning, everyone. Hmm. Dan, is my uh, far left? There we go. Am I on or off? Well, hang on. Am I on now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Maybe it's, no, my doohickey is on. Line one, could, could you go back and take a look? See where we're. Well, this is the morning for Gremlins. Um, went to turn on the uh, computer we run our live stream on, and it blue screened. So, so, ah, there we are. But now I'm probably louder than I need to be. There we go. Test two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, you can hear me now. Let's see what else can break this morning. Good morning, folks. On a maybe the sun is coming out. It's kind of a damp and murky morning today. A couple of things before we start worship. Um, there we go. It's like this is my you know Mount Sinai voice. <laughs> the, thou shall have no other gods before me. Run out of. There we go. Um, it's going to be a weird morning, I think. Um, a couple of things before we start. Um, I, I'm pretty good about remembering things as we get into the rhythm of the service. And you know, worship has its own rhythm to it. As we're trying to work things back, I'm signing I'm occasionally slipping on something. I completely blanked on a very important moment for mission yesterday, uh, last week and forgot to ask the deacons to come forward to take the offering. So if, uh, if I get in a groove and I forget something, you know, just wave at me or throw something at me or do something. I'm not, you know, it's, it's better to do that than, uh, than get me out of funk. And we do have a moment for mission this morning. And if I somehow forget about that, rise up against me and <laughs> tell me that. Um, I'm assuming there's an announcement for the um, bazaar. Okay, before you sit down, yes. I know you're in a walking boot. Can you still walk? I can walk, but it's kind of getting Can you walk up to here? Because one thing we have forgotten is to install you as a deacon, even though you've been functioning as a deacon for most of the year. Um, oh, I tell you, would you rather just stand there and I can do it from here? I can, like, call it in? <laughs> well, come on up. Let's do it now. It's not. Carol got elected to being a deacon after our normal process, so we just. And you haven't been a deacon before, correct? I have not. All right. Let me then give you the series of questions, which are easy to answer. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you boldly declare Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and acknowledge Him Lord of all and Head of the Church? Do you believe in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be by the word of God, to be the word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit and the unique witness to Jesus Christ and the authority for Christian faith and life? I do. Relying on the Holy Spirit, do you humbly submit to God's call in your life, committing yourself to God's mission and fulfilling your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and guided by the confessions? Will you be governed by ego's polity and discipline? Will you be accountable to your fellow elders, deacons, and pastors as you lead? I will. Do you promise to be faithful in maintaining the truth of the gospel and the peace, unity, and purity of the church? I will. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? It's my favorite question. Um, friends, do we as the members of this congregation 
except the sister is deacon chosen by God through the voice of the congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ, according to the word of God, most importantly and secondarily to the constitution of ECO. Then let's pray. Father, we thank you that this clarity verse has served us over the years in so many ways, now comes into a new ministry, and we thank you for setting her aside for that. We know that you will give her the gifts and the grace she needs, uh, as you give us all the gifts and the grace you need to do anything that you call us to. But we thank you for Carol, for what she has done, what she continues to do, and all the things that we will do. We continue to pray for healing for her, for her, uh, uh, her foot in the surgery and ask that you would just continue to bless us through her. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are now a deacon in this church for this congregation. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. And congratulations. Any other announcements? Yes. So if you would like to be a part of a small group discussion, uh, join, uh, come over to the fellowship hall after the service. We'll start having questions again out of the service. And, and then starting in January, we've got a really fun book study we're going to do. And that'd be a great time to do it. So any other announcements? Brian? And is that in lieu of a moment for mission or some? Okay. All right. You got a two for today. All right. Anything else? Jan. Yes, coffee things are important. Anything else? Well, then. Uh, let's stand up and say good morning to the folks around us and begin our worship and song.
Please be seated. And please join me in prayer. God, what a perfect song to lead us into confession. Oh, how great a debtor we are to your grace every day. And how easily we are able to wander. And Father, we sense those two things as we come and worship to you. We are indebted to you and you alone for our salvation, for the grace you give. While we love it at a deep level in one respect, we, we still wander. We still serve ourselves and serve the gods of this age, find idols to attach ourselves to and do things that hurt you and more than anything else hurt ourselves and those around us. So Father, in these moments of silence, hear our confession this morning as we offer up to you those things that we need to confess that you might help us by your grace to move on. Father, we thank you that we can sit here and know with, with great assurance that our, our place in your kingdom is not based on our goodness or our actions or our abilities, but only by your grace that we have received only through your son's life and death and resurrection. And for that, we give you thanks and glory and honor and praise. Help us ever to follow you more faithfully. Help us to fix ourselves upon you. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Wow, I thought they'd never leave. Um, <laughs> Well, for our Stay in Your Seats children's sermon, I thought I'd start by showing you one of my favorite uh, photographs of um, my, my youngest daughter and her, her, her grand, my granddog, Finley. Um, Finley, we've lost Finley a few years ago. He was a great dog and a great dog for her. And I, I like this just because it shows so much about what's unique about a dog. Now, y'all know that dogs are basically just wolves. And what, what is their natural instinct when they come across a food source? To eat it, eat it all as much as they can, as fast as they can. And yet this is a common scene. There he is sitting on her lap with a big plate of nachos sitting in front of him. And I'm sure that every fiber of him sits there and goes like, I want to shove my face in that and eat my share of the nachos, which should be all of them. Um, but he doesn't do it, right? He just sits there and watches and, until he's given a treat. I am convinced that probably one of the most confusing things for a dog uh, is why does this human have so much food laying around, but we're not just allowed to eat it, right? Because that makes absolutely no sense to them. Now, and I will say that by and large, most of our dogs do a pretty good job of it. Um, my lab does a pretty good job of it, but every now and then he doesn't. And a few years ago, we caught him when he didn't, I have a little surveillance camera. I actually put it in my kitchen because for a while I was leaving my stove on every now and then and I wanted to be able to check it. Well, this is what we caught him doing. It was three or four years ago, uh, one, one morning. Of course, this is why no one's home. Oh, what's that? Hmm, a pound of butter. I'm going to move it here. And then I'm going to come back a little later. And, uh, oh, there's that butter again. Well, maybe. And then I'll just take this outside. <laughs> so, what do you think happened? My dog ate a pound of butter including some of the wrappers. So what do you think happened to him? He was sick as a dog, <laughs> including throwing up a good part of it in the living room on the rug. Um, so it really worked out very bad for both of us. He, he's learned a bit of a lesson there. But he's probably still, there are things about me that he doesn't understand, and he probably never will. But the good news is that he loves me, and he's pretty much willing most of the time to do what I want because he loves me. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, in a little bit way, that's kind of like us and God. There are things God sometimes asks us to do or not do, or, or believe or not believe, that don't always make a lot of sense. I'm kind of amazed how much sense God does make. But every now and then, God asks us to do something or to not do something that makes no sense to me. Um, what I have just sort of figured is that, you know, God's a lot smarter than me and he's the one who put this all together and planned it. And if God did all that, then he probably knows better than I do. So even though this doesn't make sense to me or I think I should be able to do this and God says no, who should I probably listen to? Me or God? God, right? I mean, that's an easy one. It's easy one to sit here in church and say it's harder when we're out living our lives. But just like my good old Labrador uh, found that it didn't work well for him when he didn't do what he knew he was supposed to not do, we need to be careful that even when it doesn't make sense to us, we listen to God and do what God asks. In the long run, that'll work out the best for us. Um, and we just have to assume, because God's a lot smarter than we are, that God knows what he's doing. So thank you for listening. And head off to Sunday school if you're in a mood to head off for Sunday school. Brian, leaping out of his pew, <laughs> comes up for the moment for mission. Uh, nominating committee available last week 
to, uh, to be here to answer questions. And so this week there's only a couple of us. So that was part of the reason we had, we had wanted to do a, a, a message last week. Um, but that's all right. Thank you for gently throwing me under the bus. But <laughs> I kind of dove under it, so that's okay. Yeah, that's all right. We, we'll work it out. So um, what are the, this is uh, Stewardship Month. And uh, Al preached a couple weeks ago on, uh, on giving of your talents. And uh, you know, I sent a letter out to the congregation. And if you didn't receive one uh, with a pledge card, there are some on the back in the narthex on the table there. And we just ask you to, to uh, look at it. It's a little different this year. We're, um, you, you know, with everything that's been going on, uh, our membership is down a little bit. Our, our attendance is down. And um, so we're asking not only to, uh, to look at um, what you would be able to give and put on the pledge card, uh, which is an anonymous um, number. I mean, and, and we just ask you to, to help kind of give us an idea what you think you could give next year so we can put a budget together. But the other things that we, are, we're, we really are going to ask for is that you pray for the church, that you pray for the staff, um, and you take a moment each day to do that. Because we really are um, here, you know, doing God's uh, work and and also providing a place for for people to come that um, through this pandemic have, um, you know, they, they have needs that are, you know, they're they're isolated and we see that um, just so um, so often, you know, just you know, wearing masks, not wearing masks, things that are that are causing people to be. Um, just isolated. So we just ask for, um, for that to, uh, that you pray for that. We also ask that um, if you know someone, bring them to church that you would, that, that haven't been asked or that, that you can see they're struggling, whether it's a coworker, a friend, a stranger, just invite folks to come to, to worship with us. Um, we also have quite a few needs in the, the for volunteering, you know, whether it's helping hands or Sunday school or the backpack program. We just ask that, that you look at uh, sharing your, your talents uh, this year. And uh, the lastly, just I pray that you um, think um, how much you would want to be able to contribute this year with, with all the work changes, with uh, inflation, other things going on. Uh, we just uh, ask that you prayerfully consider uh, what you can do this year for the church. And uh, thank you. And you know, it's nice to be creeping back to normal. There are 95 of you out there this morning. An average Sunday morning before this all started would have been somewhere between 110 and 115 at the 9 a.m. service. So we're, we're, you know, we've had a lot of people leave and move and things like that, but we're not doing too bad. It's good to see you all. Well, friends, what do we have to pray about uh, this morning? It's been kind of quiet lately, Jenny. It's wonderful. What else? Yes, I see that. Oh, it's Clara. Hi, Clara. I just wanted to say how delighted I was when I knocked on the door of their house, not knowing that they were my new neighbors. Uh, <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful surprise. Oh, good. I'd, I'd ask that you pray for my mother in law, Taya. She has had her health just sort of take a bit of a turn. She's got suddenly come down with very crippling arthritis, and that's 
complicating other issues is this artist mom. And um, there's some hard decisions being made about how much care she needs and whether she can stay in her home and all of those things. So please keep her in your prayers as well. There's nothing else, then let's spend some time in prayer and you can pray out loud for these or any other concerns that uh, come to your hearts either out loud or, or in silence and we'll close together with the Lord's Prayer in just a bit. Father, thank you for gathering us here today and it feels good to be gathered. It feels good to be with each other, but, but it feels even better to be with you. So hear us as your people as, as we lift our prayers to you this morning. God, we pray for this young man, Scott, who has been injured in a motorcycle accident, and we ask that you would not only heal his body, but set his family at rest, and we pray that, uh, that all things will come together. So not only will his body be healed, but he'll see your hand of grace in it, and it will be a positive thing in his life. Pray for Eileen Stugard, who continues to struggle with breathing issues, and now is perhaps on her, on, on, on the last part of the road home to you. And we ask that you would just give her grace and mercy through this time. We pray for my mother-in-law now dealing with physical issues and memory issues. And just ask that you would wrap your arms around her and her family and bless them as they deal with this. Father, we continue to, to thank you for what's gone on in our country as we have continued to come out of this pandemic. But we know we have a ways to go, so continue to bless those who have to make difficult decisions. Uh, guide and direct them. Give our leaders wisdom in all the things that they do. And as always, we thank you for those who uh, almost invisibly for many years have always served us and protected us in our society, and yet we're so aware of them now, whether they are in hospitals or clinics or grocery stores or in a patrol car in the streets or in a military convoy far away. They're all doing so much, and we thank you for them. And Father, as we thank you for hearing all of our prayers, whether we spoke them out loud or only in the quiet of our hearts, and we ask you to hear us this together. We pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward for the morning offering? For the offering today, we would like to invite you guys to sing with us. This is a perfect morning for it because I've never heard you all singing so clearly before. I'm so encouraged by it and I... 
Hope that you will do that again, but not just sing, but also rejoice with us. The Bible says to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, so will you stand and sing and rejoice, and we even have a drum breakdown in this one, so you can even clap if you want to take it a step further. Father, with a grateful heart, we thank you for all that you have given us and all that you have done for us. And we bring these gifts back to you, asking that you would help us to use them for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
Friends, I'm going to read you a parable this morning in our series out of Matthew 22. We're at the beginning of the first verse. It's another parable of uh, the, a banquet, another parable of the kingdom and judgment. It'll sound a little familiar because we've talked about a few of the parable so banquets and judgment before this. We talked about another one, the very first one in this series. But this is different and has some different elements, and, and we're going to sort of pick those apart this morning. So we'll begin with Matthew chapter 22. We're going to go from verse 1 all the way through verse 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry. He sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they had found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. He said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness, in that place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, let me start this morning with a story that may or may not have anything uh, to actually to do with today's complicated parable. Um, way back when I was in middle school, I was part of an American Legion youth program. And often on Sundays, the leader would, uh, would take some kids with him out to run errands and do tasks. One Saturday, he told my friend and I that during our run, we would be stopping by a wedding reception for a friend's daughter named Catherine. So dress a little better than normal. So to us, that meant a clean shirt and 501 jeans. So we got to the place of the reception, and we found it was a golf club with multiple banquet rooms and several receptions going on. Our leader saw someone on the way and he needed to talk to, so he told us to go in, find a seat, and get some food. He'd be in there soon. So we went in and we looked for the sign that told you where, you know, which reception was and what room, figured out the one we wanted, and, and we went in. We, we immediately realized we were underdressed in a room filled with suits and dresses. Undaunted, we filled our plates with food, found three seats, uh, and enjoyed the food. Now, our leader must have been having some kind of a conversation because he still wasn't there by the time I finished my plate. So I decided to get seconds. While in line, an older man next to me kind of leaned in close, and he pointed at the bride, and he says, Isn't she beautiful? That's my granddaughter, Stephanie. Remember, we were looking for Catherine. So I froze for a moment. And I stammered out, yes, she's beautiful. And I quickly went back to my seat, whispered to my friend, we're in the wrong reception. I'm leaving, follow me after a minute or two so it's not too obvious. Now, we did find the right room. We found our leader who was wondering where we'd been. And yeah, we ate again, but you know, we were growing boys. Uh, later, we talked about how glad we were that no one at the first reception found us out. So let me tell you, friends, when I read a parable about someone showing up to a wedding banquet, underdressed and out of place, it resonates with me. Reading Jesus' parable, apparently, I got off easy. You know, this is one of the hardest par of Jesus' parables to, to read and fully understand. One noted author, John Lambrecht, felt enough disquiet about the parable to confess feeling that it should be ignored. Kyle Snodgrass, who I'll quote a few times, says, this parable does not sound like what we know about Jesus. So this is a hard one. Let me talk about some preliminary stuff. In our first sermon in the series, uh, we read a parable that was very similar in the Gospel of Luke. Some maintain that the parable in Luke and this one in Matthew are the same. 
simply have been altered uh, by each author for their purposes. But, but I, I don't think that's the case. There are significant differences in the parable. Uh, and both parables actually share very few words in, in Greek. So I think these are two similar parables spoken by Jesus on different occasions with somewhat different points being made. It's not grass notes, something I've said before. It's, is it not likely that Jesus spoke a given parable on a number of occasions and in different contexts, adapting it each time, perhaps, to the circumstance? A parable like that of the banquet, especially if it was a challenge to Jesus' contemporaries, may have been told numerous times in various places and forms. And I think, actually, really, this is just another reminder of how often Jesus must have spoke uh, about the kingdom of God, about judgment, and how we get into that kingdom. You know, and, and remember that most parables that have a great banquet in it are about God's people's eternal presence with God in the fullness of the kingdom after the final judgment. Now, some of the basics of this parable are not hard to understand. Try to figure out who, who Jesus is talking about. I mean, the, 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 the king is, is obviously God, the son is Jesus. Uh, the wedding can easily, I think, be seen as the wedding of the lamb to his bride, the church. You know, what, what we see in, after the final judgment. It's an image that we will eventually see in Revelation. Uh, you may remember Revelation 19.7 uh, through 9, where he says, Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory, for the marriage of the lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, pure and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saint. And the angel said, to me, write this, blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So I think that's kind of the backdrop for that. Now those first invited are either the Jewish leaders who were opposing Jesus or uh, have opposed God throughout the ages or, or perhaps the Jewish people as a whole. Uh, the servants in verse 6 are most certainly the Old Testament prophets who were ignored or mistreated. Now, just like in Luke's parable, the, the first who were invited chose not to come, and they busied themselves doing lesser things, um, if you remember. And, and, and ultimately, that part of the parable concludes that those invited were not worthy. What I want to do today, and we can spend weeks on this, is really talk first just a bit about the first part of the parable, because uh, there are really three parts to it. And, and then look at the last part and some of the layers of difficulty. Verse 7 is short, but it's full of problems. After the servants of the king are mistreated, some are killed, the king responds in one short verse. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Now, that's not exactly how we think about God, is it? But let's be honest. Read the Old Testament. And you see that many times God uses armies in war to accomplish his purpose. Uh, he destroyed the enemies of Israel and chastens his own people. You know, Sit down and read the prophets for a while. You can't miss this. Um, and, and a hard part is that it seems that in the first century church, they saw this directly aimed at Israel. Jerusalem and much of the country of Israel was destroyed in the rebellion of 68 AD, probably right around the time when God, Matthew's gospel was being compiled. So to the first generation search, this parable, this verse, probably they thought made a lot of sense in their eyes. And they actually imagined it unfolding in front of their eyes. Now the subsequent cause problem, and I know I've talked about this before, but it needs to be said again and again, is that Christians down the ages have used this scripture along with others to justify anti-Semitism or conversion of, forced conversion of Jews. And I think... That may not exactly be our problem, but we need to keep this issue ever before us and, and realize that anti-Semitism is the first wrong turn in misunderstanding any part of this parable and is, is never justified. We do have a long history to live down. And just like our blind eyes to racial injustice, we need to be vigilant that we never justify mistreating anyone by doing so in God's name. God will judge, not us we Christians would be lost without the faithful Jewish heritage that we have and our forerunners in their faith. Now, that is not to say that we affirm that Judaism offers a path to God outside of God's son Jesus and his death on a cross. 
it is not anti-Semitism to say that Jews have missed God's promised Messiah and that there may be eternal consequences for that. Um, frankly, this is what this and other teachings of Jesus are quite clear about. It's hard to accuse Jesus of being anti-Semitic. But we can never justify any anger or coercion towards the Jews from anything we find in Scripture. Friends, if there's anything there, that's God's job, not ours. This parable says nothing about punishing Jews for the death of Christ. Now, the final part of the parable. Let me reread it so it's fresh in your mind. Uh, before I do so, let me mention that some commentators, and I, I say these things because I know that some of you are really uh, good students of the Bible. You're going to hear and read and see other things. Suggest that the, the, from verse 11 on, these part, were not part of the original parable that they were from another parable, they were added later to this parable. Now, I think that's at least possible. Matthew does seem to assemble some of his gospel by topic, not by chronology. But, but that doesn't really answer any of the difficult parts here, it just pulls them apart. I assume that everything here was a part of a parable of Jesus and we're gonna treat them as such. Excuse me, so again, um, from verse 8. And then he said, the king said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite them to the wedding feast, as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to look at the guests, he saw a man there who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And kind of literally says, struck dumb. And the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot. Cast him in the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now I have to say that what happens to this man seems patently unfair to me. I mean, he gets brought to a wedding banquet by the king's servant. But when the king discovers he's not properly dressed, he's bound and cast into hell. I mean, talk about a dress code. Um, I mean, interestingly enough, I'll tell you, you know, Jesus is not the only rabbi who taught in parables. Um, not long after Jesus' ministry, we don't know exactly, probably a half century, uh, a Jewish rabbi spoke a similar parable about repentance and preparation. He wrote, It is like a king who invited his servants to a feast but did not appoint them a time. The wise among them adorned themselves and sat by the door of the palace, for they says, is anything lacking in a palace? The foolish went among them to their work and they said, is a feast ever given without preparation? Suddenly the king summoned his servants. The wise among them went in before him adorned as they were and the foolish went before him in their working clothes. The king rejoiced to see the wise and was angry to see the foolish and said, them who adorn themselves for the feast shall sit down, eat and drink. But those who did not adorn themselves for the feast shall stand and look on. Pretty similar, huh? Interesting enough, the rabbi who wrote that was from Galilee. So I wonder what if he'd heard Jesus. Now some suggest that at such feasts, kings would provide wedding cloth, clothes for the guests, and that the man then refused that or snuck in. But actually, there, there's no real evidence that this was a real practice. That said, remember that a, this is a parable of eternal judgment. Um, and like all the parables, no single parable is a complete theology. And I think we need to be careful not to, to draw one as such. Let me give you some insight again from uh, Kyle Snodgrass, who's written on this. It says, regardless of the origins of verses 11 through 13, uh, the reason Matthew includes them is clear. That both the bad and the good were gathered leads to the expectation that they will be separated. See how that ties together in the parable? More than any other Gospels, Matthew consistently reminds his readers that the unlimited grace of the kingdom always brings with it unlimited demand. The emphasis is on obedient response and an awareness of the reality of judgment. Here, the narrative plane of the story is broken by the reality being pictured. The punishment is no longer earthly, such as the disruption of cities, but the final apocalyptic judgment. That the man is expected to have a wedding garment is still troublesome. Apparently all that is intended is a clean garment. To come with dirty clothes would show contempt for the king and his banquet. Matthew's parable does not say that the people came straight from the streets. 
the parable seems to assume that a man had time to come properly attired. Efforts to identify the missing garment have usually focused on good works, repentance, salvation, love, or more generally the eschatological garment awarded to the righteous in a new age. Precise identification is both impossible and inappropriate. And I have to say it's done not in, has been done non-ceasingly for the last 19 centuries. What is important is that the man made no preparation to wear something fitting for the feast he chose to attend. If he is representative, he mirrors all the unrighteous who have made no preparation for God's judgment. The parable then, in its two parts, contains three important themes. The refusal of the religious leaders, the gathering of the kingdom, and the separation that then takes place at the final judgment. And I have to tell you, friends, that as you look at the big picture here, I think there is one Old Testament scripture that sheds a lot of light on this. It's Isaiah 61.10, where he writes, I will, rejoice, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself out like a priest with a beautiful headdress, as a bride adorns herself with her neck jewels. Doesn't that kind of sound like this parable? And remember, a parable is simply a simple story to make a point. But Jesus would have known this verse. And I think in a larger context, it fills in some of the points. That salvation and righteousness are, are nonetheless gifts. Gifts God gives to us, not things we attain for ourselves. They can be imagined like a dress of a, of a bride or a groom at a wedding feast. As I mentioned earlier, uh, that is the bride of Christ in the kingdom of God. Those who are invited to attend the banquet are both the guests and the subject of the banquet at the same time. I know for many today, the real troubling point comes when we see someone who may not have been fully aware of the expectations of the banquet, being given the ultimate bum rush. I mean, I humbly rejoice in the idea that out of his pure grace, God may have chosen me to sit at you know this table in the coming kingdom, if only for comic relief. Yet I, I too struggle with the idea that others may not have been chosen. Uh, what about the baby in Africa who died as an infant? What about the nice little old lady who was kind to everyone but had nothing to do with God? And the parable ends with a sobering line. You know, for many are called, but few are chosen. Let me, let me quote Snodgrass one more time. It says, finally, we must reflect again on judgment. This theme appears repeatedly in Jesus' teaching, and we are always uncomfortable with it. Couldn't God just be a nice God and not hold anyone accountable? Does the concept of judgment negate the promise of salvation? And then this line, without the concept of judgment, one does not even need salvation. And any urgency about life and its importance about justice or even about God, is not, if not lost, is greatly diminished. Grace is only grace if the outcome should have been otherwise. I love that line. And the significance of life depends on accountability for life. We may not like judgment, but it is a central and necessary message of both Testaments, especially the teachings of Jesus. Or as Michael Wilkins writes, therefore, while there is an open invitation to the kingdom, from the divine perspective, it is only God's sovereign choice that affects salvation. From a human perspective, it is only those who respond to the call appropriately that are a part of the banquet. Only an appropriate response reveals God's divine election. So it's still God doing the saving, not us. Whether we understand it all or not. Let me finish with a practical application for a difficult topic that I know that I cannot fully explain. If in the end it's God's choice who belongs at the banquet, then what should we do? Nothing? I think the simple answer is that what we do is invite. We invite everyone. And then we let God worry about the rest. Way back in 2005, we took a small mission team to Antalya, Turkey, to run a children's day camp in the poor rural outskirts of the city. In spite of the language and cultural differences, it was an amazing week, really with one exception. The woman who ran the small local school that we used had something against one little girl 
in the neighborhood. The little girl wanted to come to the program, but the woman told us she could not come and sent her away. It was quite a sad sight. Now, some of you may remember Carrie Barnes, a young woman with a big heart from our congregation who came with us. She saw what was happening. Tears welled up in her eyes, and mild-mannered Carrie stormed out of the school, trotted down the dirt street to where the girl was sitting, and this is actually a picture of it, talked to her, took her by the hand, led her back into the school with an absolute nobody mess with me look on her face. And nobody did. That little girl uh, and Carrie were good friends all week. Now what happened to the little girl? I have no idea. But she was invited to the banquet by a servant of the king. And if a tie-dyed t-shirt is a fit, fitting wedding garment, she just might make it. So friends, invite. Let God worry about the rest. Let's pray. Father, thank you that, that we all come to a banquet that um, we're not really fit for. That we're told in scripture that our, our dirty clothes are made white in you by, by the blood of Jesus. And, and we all come humbly to a place that, that we don't deserve to be. And how that all works out and who gets to stay and who gets to lose is, is, is your business, not ours. But help us to be humble and thankful for our invitation. And help us to do what you have called your servants to do. And that's invite. We do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We please stand with us.
friends, go out from this place into the world as servants of the King and invite. And may God's grace and mercy and peace and presence be with you now and forevermore.